Taking my cue from Lorna, um, recently I uh, started getting into feminism. Now, it's not that I didn't really believe in it before. I mean, I always called myself a feminist and, and respect the feminist, but to be quite honest, I was probably just paying it lip service, as most guys call themselves feminists do. Uh, but later in the year, I'm going to be playing on stage Andrea Dworkin. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for people here who know who Andrea Dworkin is, you'll probably find that the most bizarre percentage I like what you hear all week. Um, but it's obviously uh, encouraged me to engage with feminism in a much more deep way than I was before. <laughs> and what happens is, um, that none of this will be any news to the women here whatsoever, obviously. Um, but when she put on those X-ray specs and start reading the world in a feminist way, you can't see it everywhere, really. I mean, sexism exists. <laughs> it's real. And some of it's awful. Um, so I'll give, you, I'll give you one of the milder examples. Uh, me and my partner were watching the Oscar ceremony, I don't know if you saw it last week. Um, it was hosted by Seth MacFarlane, who's a writer and comedian who appeals to young people. Wrote Family Guy. And he sang, so this guy hosting it, the Oscars, Hollywood, Hollywood celebration of itself, the most enshrined ritual, and one of the most enshrined rituals in America, for that matter. Um, and he sang this song called We've seen your boobs. And he listed all of the actresses, some of whom were nominated, and they named the film that he'd seen their boobs in. So forget the fact that the talented actresses and artists in their own right, for the purposes of that song, they were a set of boobs. And I turned to my partner and I was like, that's sexist. <laughs> She's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you were get the point out. <laughs> so, um, we can put on different kinds of specs and read the world in different kinds of ways, as I'm sure most of you know you can put on you know, class specs and start to interrogate the word jazz and what's meant by it, is this simply just uh, laughing at poor people, this is a, a, a hideous. Uh, and we can put on our race specs and see the institutionalised racism and uh, you know, organisations like the police that are supposed to protect people. And we can put on our Scottish specs. And that's what we did today. So, um, identity, right, wow, um, obviously identity is complex, but in some ways it's very simple. The, let's start with the cringe. <laughs> no, in fact, you know what, let's start with the hats <laughs> that you saw earlier, the CU Jimmy hats, you know the ones with the yeah. cami and the, uh, the ginger hair. Yeah. Does anybody know where that image came from? Russ Abbott. Russ yeah. Comedian who was popular in the 80s. <laughs> Russ Abbott started the Madhouse and he had a character called See You Jimmy who put on the tammy and the ginger hair and he spoke in this impenetrable Scottish accent and he was always drunk, right? <laughs> now, you can take that as a bit of a laugh if you like. Or you could say this is kind of the Scottish version of blackface, which has been beamed at us and we have received and said, yeah, that is us. <laughs> we are comedy drunks. And so when it comes for the cases of national celebration, like a football match, we put these hats on and laugh at ourselves because that's what we've been told that we are. So it's no wonder that something like the Scottish cringe exists, the inferiority complex, which we're seeing in the referendum debate all the time. We can't do it. It's a nice idea, son, but we can't do it. We're too mean, we're too poor, we'll arse it up, we're better sticking where we are. And um, this has been internalised, and it's not only been internalised, it's been fostered. It's not in our DNA, it's not in our blood, it's not genetic, it's not biological, it's cultural. Of course it is. So where did it come from? Why are we embarrassed by our own culture? Why are we embarrassed by our own language? Why do we hear people say, which I used to say when I was younger, when I hear a Scottish accent on the telly, I'm mortified. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever said that or felt it or, or heard anybody else say it. I've certainly That's said it. Wrong. And I think it's because, well, first of all, we are told that we're inferior, and secondly, we're so unused to hearing our own voices through the culture. We're very rarely on television. Most of our television comes from England and it comes from America. So Scottish accents on television in Scotland are an anomaly. Scottish film, of course, is an anomaly. This is the case in France or Italy. They expect to go to the cinema and hear French or German Italian accents. Um, in fact, I was 20 before I read a novel by a Scot. 
which was train spotted by Evan Welsh. Mm -hmm. And I was a reader when I was young. I, by the time I was 20, I'd seen one film that was made by Scots, which was Gregory's Girl. Now, we start to see a composite picture. A child can go through school and experience one Scottish writer, Burns, in January, open the cupboard, let Burns out, hey, put it back in again. <laughs> That's how it goes. As it happens, I studied to Norman Kay when I was in high, to be fair. We have one department of Scottish literature in our universities in Scotland, Glasgow. We have one professor of Scottish literature, Alan Rea. Alan Rea, who was asked on national television when he did an interview with the writer A.L. Kennedy, is there such a thing as Scottish literature? <laughs> now, of course, that question is ridiculous, but that it had to be asked. Can you imagine anybody saying, is there such a thing as English literature? Is there such a thing as American literature? Of course there is. Now, my first novel was published 12 years ago. And something has occurred to me over the, the course of these years. I never used to question. Whenever I'm uh, introduced on stage as a writer, not always, but often, especially in schools, this is Alan Bissett. He's a Scottish writer. Yeah. Which is true, obviously. Why am I called the Scottish writer in Scotland? Mm. When I've done panels in England, and I'm introduced as Scottish writer, well, of course that makes sense, but the English writers are never introduced as English writers. In America, American writers are never introduced as American writers, because that's the most natural thing in the world, that a writer can come from somewhere like England or America. But in Scotland, why is a Scottish writer so exotic, so deviant, that the word Scottish would be used as a prefix to writer, to signify that. Why is the National Theatre of Scotland called the National Theatre of Scotland? Mm -hmm. Instead of the National Theatre. The National Theatre is in London, that's the National Theatre. And then we start to get the constructions of reality, and that's when we start asking real questions about identity. So, um, to come back to, first of all, two essays in uh, the book edited by Scott Ames, Unstated. Absolutely brilliant book, read it. Such a diverse of opinion in it, but certainly um, I open in many ways. Some of you might be familiar with the Alistair Gray affair that happened at the end of last year. Um, when Alistair Gray, in case anyone doesn't know who Alistair Gray is, in fact, we don't know who Alistair Gray is, that kind of proves the point I'm making. Um, Alistair Gray is probably Scotland's greatest living writer, um, and he painted the ceiling of Orrin Moore in the West End of Glasgow, and if you've ever seen it, incredible, incredible artist. And he asked the question, why are there so few Scots running national Scottish arts organisations? Because there are almost none. And this isn't an issue of the individual people in those jobs. Some of them are very good at their job and, and very talented and probably care very deeply about Scotland. But there is a pattern. Um, the last director of the National Theatre of Scotland, Vicky Ferriston, was from England. The new director of the National Theatre of Scotland um, is from England. The last director of the Theatre of Scotland was from England. We're still waiting to hear who the new appointment for the next director of Creative Scotland will be, but mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's not as of the yeses until uh, there's a verdict. So uh, he asked this question, which seems to be the most obvious question in the world. Why? Why is this the case? Why don't we trust Scots to run national arts organisations? And he used the discourse of colonialism. Now that is obviously a contentious word. And it's for every person in this room to decide for themselves if Scotland's a colonised country or not. You're all capable of reading history books. But the raising of the question was absolutely punished. The media storm that was created lasted a week. It was ferocious, it was in the front page of newspapers. It was denounced as a racist, it was denounced as a bigot. Of course it was denounced as anti-English, because that obviously had to be the motivation behind this question. And why did this happen? Is it because the C word is the word that will not be named? Is it because it might have been taking people uncomfortably towards the truth? Who knows? But the question itself had to be punished and was punished. Now, in comparison, we can look at the ways in which uh, artists who are not from Scotland have um, expressed their national identity. Now, let's take one example. When I was young, Britpop, 1993, most exciting year probably of my life. Started at university, Swede's first album comes out, and after that you get blurred, you get Oasis, pulp, boom. Huge flower in British youth culture. 
um, and uh, an enormous sort of energy around the nation, the, the idea of a British identity. Uh, Damon Albarn, who was the, uh, the songwriter in Blur, wanted British music to become, he actually said, Anglo-centric, which itself is revealing. You know, why are England and Britain used as euphemisms? Well, because often culturally they are euphemisms. And he said, we're sick of America's cultural mm -hmm. domination over England. We're sick of the way that America has colonised, American culture has colonised the UK. And we're taking it back. Our manifesto is, fuck America. Mm -hmm. Now, he wasn't called an anti-American bigot. He wasn't called a racist. That wasn't seen as aggressive. That was seen as progressive. He was the vanguard of the new artistic moment, which dominated the 1990s in this country. He was rewarded for saying, well, in far stronger language, what Alistair Gray said about Scotland. One of them was rewarded, one of them was punished. And I'll leave it up to you to conclude why. So, two things. One, we make it difficult for Scots to access their own identity. Because when Scots access their identity, their language, their history, their literature, they become self-aware. When they become self-aware, well, shit like independence referendums happens. So this is why things have been very fierce. This is why uh, anybody who wants to have this conversation is either deemed dangerous or parochial. These are uh, very loaded, uh, parochial is a very loaded term that's used to marshal that discussion. Automatically, it seems to be an anti aggression <coughs> The assertion of the Scottish identity is automatically aggressive. That's the way in which it has been described. So you also delegitimise a sense of grievance. Um, so Scotland can't be oppressed because it took part in the empire. Well, we didn't get a vote in taking part in the empire. <laughs> How much of that mercantile wealth trickled down to the slums of Glasgow or the empty highlands? Why were so many Scots killed disproportionately in imperialist wars? Why do we uh, then judge the success of a social project or what it says about a country or any kind of um, group by the success of its elites, because of course many Scots profit from the empire, but they were the elites. That's like saying that because Barack Obama is president of the United States, racism doesn't exist. <laughs> or, or, or like saying that because some women make money from lap dancing, therefore lap dancing can't be sexist. Uh, so these are the ways in which the debate is managed. And I think uh, if there is a yes vote in 2014, culturally, not only I think will there be a flower in Scotland as, as the artists try to um, recreate the country, but we will finally work out what kind of country we actually are. And that for me um, is one of the most exciting things. Thank you.